Well, I just want to thank you for letting me come and share this story with you. I've given this talk so many times in my head and, um, and in different ways, in different places. And um, when I was trying to think about how to start this story today, I think what I'll do is just give you a quick overview of the kind of work that I do and what plant systematics is. So the field of plant systematics is kind of at the foundation of, of the field of biology. It includes taxonomy, um, looking at things like evolutionary processes and speciation and adaptation, but then also this word called phylogeny, which is really just a fancy name for a family tree. And we can build family trees at different levels, but what's exciting about plant phylogenies is that we're looking back in time. So we see the branch tips, but we're establishing relationships that have, um, that have changed over time. Okay, so in addition to um, you know, looking at different aspects of life like taxonomy and classification and phylogeny and evolutionary processes, systematists also study life at different taxonomic levels. So this really pretty diagram here is actually um, a tree representing relationships among the flowering plants, of which there's over 300,000 species described um, in science so far. So there's a lot of diversity. So some people are looking at large-scale relationships among families and groups. And then there are folks like me that study at a much smaller, um, finer level. And I'm interested in relationships among species in a particular genus, in a particular family. But before I tell you about those technical things, I want to tell you a little story, um, because I like stories, and I think this is a good story. I'm a first-generation college student. I never really expected to go to graduate school, but I was inspired by a professor as an undergraduate who said, we need more taxonomists. We need people to understand the diversity of life, and that moved me in such a way I mean, it doesn't hurt that as a kid, I spent a lot of time wandering around outside looking at plants. But um, that just stayed with me. And even though science didn't come easy to me and I, I struggled, um, I eventually found my place among museum collections. Um, and then that's where I met my husband, Steve, who's sitting in that third row there. And Steve is key to this story because he is an expert on the floor of Nebraska. So he's a taxonomist as well, and he understands how to tell different things apart. But he has an amazing memory and can hold lots of species in there and lots of questions. And he can tell you things about when something was last collected. And so if we go back about 22 years ago to Oglala, Nebraska, um, in the summertime, we were teaching a class together. Steve was teaching the floor of Nebraska, and I was his trusty sidekick and field assistant. And it was my first time doing this, and I was so excited and so very nervous. And on our day off, we traveled to Colorado. We drove south from Oglala, and we made all these plant collections, and we got back after dark. And I don't know about you, but you know, if you've been out tromping around outside, you get really hungry. So boy, I can tell you it's a real disappointment when you get back to the field station and the only thing that's left for dinner is salad. <laughs> so we hightailed it back to, um, back to town and had a veggie lover's pizza. And I'm sure like, like lots of fun dinner conversations, we ended up having this wonderful conversation about plants and taxonomy and big picture questions. And I am prone to being very anxious and worried. And I said, Steve, I need, I need something to think about to keep my brain busy. Do you have any problems just floating around? And Steve said, you know, you like the Borage family which I do. I thought, this is a plant family with a sense of humor. It's got these cute little flowers, and then when you're not looking, you get their burrs and their seeds all stuck in your pants. Like, if that isn't funny, I don't know. Okay, okay it's not that funny, but I, I don't, that's how I remembered the Borage family. So I said, Steve, I would really like a problem, and he said, here's a problem for you. There are two species um, that grow in the Great Plains in this genus Lapula that kind of have this, this fuzzy identity. So one is called Lapula squarosa, and it seems like it's an introduced weed, and it grows all over the place. And then there's this other plant. 
and we only see it in the Badlands. And some people have called it Lapulus sancrosoides, but some people say it's just the same thing as Lapulus sclerosa. And don't get too caught up in worrying about the names. The point really is that we think that we understand the world, right? And the natural world and everything's cut and dry, but, but there are always questions to be answered. And sometimes those questions are as fundamental as what is this thing and what should we call it? And that was the nature of this question. Remind, um, remember that I said this was 22 years ago, and I'm still not bored. <laughs> this question has stayed with me for years and has provided endless entertainment and opportunities that, that have led me to where I am today. So this is a picture of some, family, um, some plants in the forget-me-not family. Its scientific name is the Boragenaceae, named after the genus Borage. That's the picture that you see in the center there. They're um, quite cosmopolitan. They grow throughout the temperate regions of the world and are particularly diverse in Western North America and then also in parts of Western Asia. Fairly big family. But let's get back to this question. You know, I, I've given lots of scientific talks, but when I visit with a general audience, I thought, well, I'd rather tell you a little bit more about how we go about solving problems like these. Where do you even start? And you can see that there are arrows among all of these things because it's really kind of just this ongoing back and forth between making observations in the field, between reading the literature, between consulting flora manuals, and, and also looking at herbarium specimens. And I'm gonna show you a picture here in a minute of herbarium specimens and what I mean by that and how um, important specimens and museums are to doing botanical research. Okay. But this is where I started. I started with a book called The Flora of the Great Plains. And I opened it up and I read the description for the genus Lapula and I used the glossary to learn all the different parts that I needed to know and the, you know, the terms that are used to describe it and where it grows and where it likes to live and what names are used. There's a lot of information packed into those pages. But I didn't stop there, believe me. I wish I could truck over all the mountains of books that I've looked at and floristic treatments and flora of Turkey. And I mean, it just kind of just keeps going. It all keeps going. But we can use a floral manual to learn more about the classification of a plant. Um, you can ask questions like, well, what are genera that are closely related to it? What are the species names that have been used for this plant? How do I, like I said, know the words that are used to talk about these plants so that I can understand what I'm seeing and communicate with you what I'm seeing? And then I can learn about the distribution and the kinds of places where they like to grow. So flora manuals are a great way to start, but it's really not the only place. This is a picture of, of the herbarium that's here on the Chadron State Campus. It's in the Coil Building. And I know it doesn't look like much, but it really is an amazing place because hidden in those cabinets is essentially a library of biodiversity. You can go in and pull out specimens and you can see different plants from different families that grow in different places around Nebraska and the Great Plains. And you can go to other collections and other places where other people have collected plants. And because these things are preserved in perpetuity, we hope, and because these things are in the public trust, right, in care for you and for me, these specimens are available for study. And when I'm associated with a collection, I can borrow plants from other places. And in doing that, I can see across time. I can look at plant specimens that were collected when explorers were going across and plotting out the railroads. I can look at plants that I collected last month or that maybe someone else collected two years ago. But the idea is that I can see more in space and in time than I possibly could by just making my own observations in the field. So it's a very special thing. This is a picture of what's inside of the cabinet. So all the plants are arranged and they're kept in folders. And the idea is to protect them from insect damage and to keep them safe and organized so that people can use them to study. 
But of course, field observations are important as well. And so now we're going to go away a little bit from the how of the story back to the what, so that I can tell you a little bit about the genus Lapula that's in the Borage family. So we have a picture of Lapula sclerosa growing in its native habitat, which is steppe in Siberia. And you can see in some ways it doesn't look too different from the mixed grass prairies that we have around here. And then at the very top, it's a fancy word, maricarp, but what's kind of cool about this genus is that it makes a fruit that are, that's made up of four little nutlets and they're called maricarps. And looking at those fruits um, is an important way to identify them and to tell them apart. Those are the characteristics that are useful. They do have pretty little blue flowers, but it turns out most of them have pretty little blue flowers. Some of them are white, some of them are lavender. They're all pretty small, so the flower that you're looking at is about the size of my pinky nail. Some of the smallest ones are two to three millimeters. Some of the largest, like the ones that I started studying on the Great Plains, get up to about four millimeters, but very small. Same with the fruits. And so what you're looking at on the right, I just labeled them. You don't have to worry about the terms, but the idea is that those specialized terms are important for being able to describe what you're looking at and understand what you're looking at. The two fruits at the bottom are actually scanning electron micrographs that were taken to try and understand a little bit more about the details. But hopefully you get a gist of what these things look like. They're cute little guys. They're distributed generally throughout the temperate zones. There are just one or two species that occur. There's one that grows in South America called Lapula Patagonia, Patagonica. And then there's a Lapula capensis in South Africa. And when I made the map, um, we thought that there might be a species in Australia, but it turns out that, um, that it's in a different genus. But the idea is that there's about 70 worldwide, and many of them are what we would call a narrow endemic, which means that they're not widespread weeds at all. They're specialists that grow in small, like, small distributions and only occur in those places. And the more I began to learn about, you know, I had that initial question, but the more I started peeling back the layers, the more I realized, like, wow, there are just like so many other questions in here. If they're diverse in Asia, maybe, just maybe, they're diverse in the Western United States as well, where we have basins and mountain ranges. Out of all of those, only two species are widespread weeds. One of them was where I initially started my question, Lapula squirosa. They occur in a variety of habitats, but you can see from the pictures that these are fairly kind of rough places, right? Like the Great Plains, um, sparsely vegetated areas and badlands. They occur in steppes and semi-deserts, semi-deserts in Asia, and, um, and rocky outcrops. And we'll revisit some of that. But back in 2003, um, our colleague and friend, Dr. Whedon, helped me write a grant to the Shadron State College Research Institute, and that's where it all began. We were at first just trying to resolve these two things. What, where does Lapula sclerosa grow? Where does this other thing grow? Does it just grow in the badlands out at, you know, at, at, in the Nebraska forest or other badlands too? And what kind of places? And is it a weed or is it not? And the first summer we spent a lot of time just exploring, and it was amazing how much we learned just in that first season. It seems that, at least in our area, these things tend to grow in smectite clays derived from volcanic ash deposited eons ago. At first I thought, well, maybe it's just because they like these kinds of soil, but it turns out they're just not very competitive and they just end up being there. But again, that's still something to explore, but they like these sort of empty outwash areas. And it's funny because when you go farther north, those layers show up in a different stratigraphy, but they still kind of show up in that same kind of sparsely vegetated gumbo, right? And that's where they like to be, or at the edges of sod tables, not the tall ones, just the short ones. And that's where they like to grow. Okay, so don't get overwhelmed by all of this. What I want you to see here is that taxonomy isn't this static thing where you put a name on it and it stays in that box forever, it's fluid. And just like any other scientific question, it changes depending on what the evidence suggests. Now, it's not entirely an objective science because we're human beings and we look at things and we have to form opinions. 
and especially when you don't have a lot of specimens to look at or you don't have a lot of data, you're just working with what you have at hand. And so this reflects just changes over time. So by the time that um, Nelson and McBride wrote a treatment in 1916, a number of species had been described and people recognized that we had diversity in North America and that it was spread throughout the Western United States. Ivan Johnston, by 1924, he was an expert on this family and he also recognized quite a bit of diversity. Now Brand was working out of, out of Germany and he kind of had some crazy ideas. It turns out like some of his stuff didn't make sense, but at least he recognized different species. But by the time we get to the 20th century, most botanists who worked in systematics held up their hands and said, you know what, this thing's a mess. I can't tell one thing from the other. Tell you what, if it has two rows of spines, we'll call it Lapula sclerosa, maybe Lapula fremontii, which was an older name for this thing that we find in the Badlands. And if it has one row of spines, we'll call it Lapula radowskii, which is actually a name of something that grows in Asia. Hopefully what the impression you get from this is that it's just kind of a mess. So by the time I picked it up, I was just like, wow, this really is a mess. This isn't a simple question of one species versus another. I've got a whole genus to work with here. That was really exciting. Just, you know, kept me up at night. And it would make me really angry when I would open up a flora and it'd be like, oh, Lapilus grossa, anything else is Lapilus radowski because that's not what I saw. My first year in the field and looking at specimens, I was able to take discrete measurements of the morphology and where it grows and very clearly delineate two distinct things. And boy, you'd get up in North Dakota and out on the, like, the steps and stuff, Lapula sclerosa was growing like a weed. It was growing on the top of sod houses. It was growing in parking lots. Not so with this thing we now call Lapula fremontii. It was very hard to find. But the question is, what is it? It looks very similar to a few species in Asia. There are people that argued, well, you know, a lot of this stuff just comes over as ballast, right, or in seed contaminants. So, nah. And it grows in waste places anyway in the Great Plains, who cares? And I'm kind of painting a broad brush and being sarcastic, but that's often how it feels to us folks who work in the Plains. It's like, yeah, who cares? So at one point I realized I couldn't solve this without, um, without going back to school. <laughs> I didn't want to go back to school. I didn't necessarily want to get a doctorate. And trying to find somebody who was, um, because I would just come in and do my spiel, like this is the work I've done and this is my question and I'd really like to come and work in your molecular phylogenetics lab on this project. <laughs> they would say, well Susan, usually you work on what your professor wants to do. And I said, well that's great, but I really don't care. I mean, if I have to do it, I will, but whatever. I'll just go back and do my own thing. Well, eventually I met Dr. Carolyn Ferguson and she took me up on it and said, okay, I have no money and like, we'll have to figure out how to do this, but sure, come on, you work in my lab and I'll teach you these things. And um, I mean, it wasn't that simple, <laughs> but that's where it started. And so this is kind of the mental framework I was in when I went into my doctoral program. We knew that there were 26 species at least described from North America, but we didn't know what names um, should be applied. We knew that Ivan Johnston, who was the last person to really study this group as a whole, that family, recognized 13 native taxa. taxa. But that was back in 1924, and he was just an herbarium taxonomist. So the challenges for me were I was dealing with a complicated taxonomy, inconsistent application of names, and very complex patterns of morphological variation, and really no idea whether I was looking at stuff that was native to North America or not. But I can tell you that I, I had a hypothesis that there were because these things were growing in native habitats, and they were, they were very picky about where they liked to grow. So I wanted to ask these questions. Are there distinct North American taxa? How are the North American taxa related to one another? Could I figure that out? And could I revise the taxonomy of the North American lapula? And that was based primarily on herbarium specimens and field observations. So about 2010, my advisor was able to get a grant that, um, that put me as a, as, a teach, as a resident scientist in a middle school classroom or high school classroom. 
and I was there for a year, and together we wrote a grant, a supplemental grant, that allowed us to take a teacher with us to Russia. And I was able to meet my hero and counterpart on the opposite side of the world, Svetlana Ofshnikova, who had written really the, the only other comprehensive treatment of this group. But she wasn't here, she wasn't in St. Petersburg. My other hero, who I didn't bring, um, Popov, he wrote the floor of the USSR treatment of Lapula that was pretty much my go-to to try and understand what I was looking at. So we started off in St. Petersburg. This is the Komarov Botanical Institute. And I show you this picture just because there's my friend, M.G. Popov, he's deceased now, but I just, I can't describe what it was like going up those stairs and going into that collection and being able to touch those specimens and look at them and see the work that he had done and to begin to understand for myself what the species were in Asia. Because really, we're talking about Russia, but it's Asiatic Russia is where these grow. And down into Kazakhstan and Western China and Turkey. And this collection was crucial to being able to make some of those initial observations. And so you can see that um, there was no climate control. There were cabinets of wood. Um, but there I was, spread out with my my, um, I had a, a Russian English dictionary, I had something to decode the Cyrillic alphabet, and I couldn't do it fast enough, so I had learned to write in Cyrillic so that I could take my notes in Cyrillic to translate later. I'm still working on that. I mean, it was just really, it was crazy. We didn't have much time. And there's my advisor, Carolyn, and we're doing our little photo shoot, like, look, we're working together. <laughs> But there was time for fun as well. We stayed in a hostel. That's that building sandwiched there in the first. And I had a chance to visit some cultural sites and travel and just a few days. The funny thing is they were the ones that wanted to travel. I'm like, no, leave me in the museum because I need to look at these plants. But they made me take breaks and that was worth it. And then we took a flight to Novosibirsk, which is in central Siberia. And there I am with Svetlana. This was, I love this picture because she went one way down the road and I went one day down, one, the other way. And then we came back and she's like, Susan Lapuchka! And I was like, oh, Lapuchka! Which is what she called Lapula. It was amazing. The sad thing was is we couldn't speak each other's language. So just like I could write in Russian and was trying to understand and could not understand. Um, Svetlana, of course, had been trained in the 1980s, and so being able to write in English was a big part of what she could do, but communicating through spoken word was pretty much impossible. Um, we tried, but I could pretty much say, where's the bathroom, I like bread, I study plants, and tea is nice. <laughs> I like tea with sugar and lemon. And, well, I'll get to that in a second, but here we are. I mean, doesn't this look like something we could go out and see in May? This is August in, in um, central Siberia, around Novosibirsk. And there's Lapula sclerosa growing in its native habitat. And one of the things that's very important is hospitality. And so we were taken out and wined and dined and fed. And my advisor kept giving me the glass of wine because I have a big German liver. And she's like, drink this. <laughs> Okay, and eat the stinky fish. Okay, I'll eat the stinky fish, because I did what I was told. But there we are collecting bilberries, that are like blueberries. It was just really amazing. There's so many beautiful things to see in that part of the world. And you know, despite um, you know, the, the current political situation, the people I met were so kind. I lived with Svetlana for the entire time that I stayed in Novosibirsk and they took us to the zoo, and that cheeky little monkey over there stole somebody's cell phone, and I just thought that was the funniest thing ever. And I took lots of pictures of birdhouses at the zoo. I don't know, I just thought those were really cool. So then, Svetlana and I flew to Lake Baikal, so that's even farther east. Farther east, yes, sorry, I'm spatially challenged, but yes, farther east, and we met up with a group of scientists from um, St. Petersburg, and we worked together, and I, I didn't, so no one spoke English. Someone spoke just a very little bit. The only way I knew where I was is by, um, by coordinates that I wrote down and like a few choppy, I mean, I knew I was near Lake Baikal, because there's the lake. 
But we ended up being in the trans Baikal region, and it turned out I think we were looking for um, endangered plants and endangered habitats, but no one could communicate this to me. So everything was just, I just went along for the ride and smiled and you know, did my thing. But here we are driving down the road um, to catch the ferry to go to Ohon Island, which is an island in Lake Baikal. And the reason why this is so significant to me is because this is the type locality of that plant I told you, Lapula Radowskii, the one that they said was the one that grows here in North America. And I was able to see it in its native habitat. So here we are walking around in rocky outcrops um, on a whole island. There are a number of cairns. Um, this area has a shamanistic culture. Um, and religion, and so there you would find places where there would be offerings of ribbons and rocks where someone felt moved to mark this as a sacred place. And Olhon is a very sacred place. And growing at the very edge, if you can see it, here's, here it is with its little blue flowers. So that was really exciting to get to see it in its native habitat and close up of the flowers. The truth is these are not my pictures of Svetlana's because Susan's forgetful and I left my camera in someone's pasture and realized it along with my field notebook two hours later and was like, oh crap. And I, I tried to communicate like, we need to go back. <laughs> Sorry. And then Svetlana said, oh, I asked Petit. Susan, this happened all, Susan, because <laughs> Susan. Susan doesn't know how to tie the secret bot botanical knot for tying your presses, because I never learned. Susan didn't know like, how to cut the cabbage that day, because the same knife that you use for collecting plants is the cabbage cutting knife. And sometimes it shreds, and sometimes it squares, and sometimes, and I was like, what? And then you don't eat the potato skins, because they're dirty, and you take off your shoes, because they're dirty. So what do you do with your collecting knife? You put it in the fire, and then the grad student laughs at you and says, oh, Susie, germs, bacteria, scary. Yeah, that was Dennis. He was always like, Susie, give me silica gel. So, but yeah, I had a lot of fun. Um, that was our field vehicle, and um, because we didn't have a lot of resources at our disposal, every day we'd press our plants, and then we would have to sit at the end of the day and unpress the plants, so take them out of the press, put them in fresh newspaper so they don't get soggy. Now here we've got blotters and cardboards. Oh no, 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 not there. We were using newspapers from the 1980s, and then we would hang them up to dry and then reuse them again. And you had to use the secret botanical knots to tie your presses because no straps. And what you see at that bottom left is our presses um, leaned up against each other to dry them because you want your plants to dry quickly so they make good specimens and they don't get moldy and rot because that's no good. All right. But look at that. Wouldn't you think that was just right? I, I just, people hear Siberia and they think snow. Yes, in the winter, just like here. But this is summer, no snow. And horses and cows. And... This is Svetlana and I at the Institute, and once we came back from Lake Baikal and environs, I spent the rest of my time in the herbarium studying her specimens, studying collections, and I just really love the vibe of that picture on the right with the green walls, and it's just very cool. So it was a really neat experience. That center hallway is the corridor. Everybody gets there at the same time, and at five o'clock it's time to go, and everybody gets in the little bus, and they go back to their particular high rise. So I stayed in one of those Soviet era, um, it looks very cold building on the outside, but very warm on the inside. And I know that the lighting isn't great, but at the very top, that's Svetlana trying to put on a shawl that I, I tried to make her, but was really more like a little scarf. And didn't make it to shawl, because they didn't like me knitting on the plane. And there, um, Svetlana shared with me pictures of her youth when when she was an activist and, and you know, pro-democratic student back in the 1980s agitating for change and you know, it's just really neat. And that's her, her father who was the same age as my dad and he would love to tell me, I can jump in my new red shoes. That was what he learned to say. So it was just really wonderful. And ice cream, we ate lots of ice cream. There's the ice cream stand down at the bottom. Svetlana loved to buy me ice cream cones, so I ate lots of ice cream. It was fabulous. It was a really wonderful experience. Um, personally, 
but of course also professionally. It was just hard because we didn't have enough time and there's so much we wanted to say. So I'm trying to figure out what time it is. How long? Oh, it's 7.30. What time? I start at 7. We're good. We're good. Sorry. I just, I get so carried away. So now I'm going to shift gears again and get back to the story of, of the, the science, what we did, how we did it, and, and the sampling. So again, there's my favorite picture of Svetlana and I. That was just really great. So I use some, what's called silica gel. Um, so they make cat litter out of this stuff sometimes. It's, um, it absorbs moisture very quickly, and that's important because when you're sampling DNA, you want to make sure that the DNA doesn't degrade. And while techniques have improved for working with degraded DNA, it's a lot easier when you've got a good quality sample. And so I collected specimens that became herbarium specimens, and then samples from those um, became dried leaves that I would work with. So this map just shows, uh, you know, you can see it's somewhat limited sampling. And again, I think I mentioned not having much in the way of a budget. But we did what we could. And we sampled more than really anybody ever had before because no one had done this before for this genus. So I show this picture of a plant cell because there are different parts of the cell that have DNA. There's the nucleus that has the nuclear DNA. And then there's the chloroplast. And even the mitochondria, the engine of the shell, also has DNA, but it's not very useful for studying relationships in plants. So the DNA is like the blueprint that tells the cell when it makes copies of itself, right? And that, um, that can change over time and evolve at different rates. Some parts of the DNA change rather quickly, some are conserved. Like for example, you don't want your mitochondria or your chloroplast having a lot of mutations. I mean, I'm ascribing purpose, but just bear with me. The idea is that if there are mutations in essential functions, that's harmful. Those individuals won't survive. So we, we end up with what are called conserved regions, places where the DNA just doesn't change. And we use those like bookends. Then there are places that do change. And depending on what level of taxonomy you're looking at, so family, genus, species, you can get information that can tell you things about relationships. So, and I'll show you the results in, the, in a minute um, and have some comments about that, but we were able to sample from something called the ITS region, which has been shown to be useful at the species level, and then we also looked at some regions from the chloroplast. And I consulted literature, to, you know, to learn you know, what has been useful. But honestly, at the time that I was working in this family, people were just starting to get, you know, into this, on this particular group. It just hadn't been, group being the whole family Boraginaceae, there wasn't a lot of work done. And this is a picture of our lab, because I think it'd be fun to just kind of show you what happens there. So I told you that I take the dried plant samples, and then you can see I've got a little mortar and pestle there, and I grind it to a fine powder. And that will make it easier for the next step because we have to get the DNA out of the cells somehow, right? So we have to break down that cell wall. And so we use a detergent, it's called CTAB, but it's, you could think of it as just being like a dish soap. We have to break down the lipids. We have to break down the cell wall. We have to get that all agitated. So we use heat and chemicals to break that all apart. We keep all of our samples separate there's a lot of attention paid to detail because you don't want to mess those things up. And then I didn't show the next part, but basically it's, it's an amplifier. It's called PCR, polymerase chain reaction. And you can make more and more copies of these regions that you're interested in so that you can study them. And then to me, this is, this is also the fun part. So what you're looking at, it's called an alignment. So the sequences come back and we can put them in alignment. And you can see there's not a lot of variation, but there is some. And it's that variation that we can use um, algorithms to calculate what eventually becomes a phylogenetic tree. So what I'm showing you is something that's gone through a lot of work. So there's statistical analyses to test, you know, just how, um, how strong of a support there is for a particular branch. Um, there's a lot of steps that go into it, and it looks like a black box, but when you're in there doing it, you realize it's really not a black box, and that um, 
Well, it's just, I don't know what, what else I can say about that. I want to walk over to the tree because that's what I want to share with you right now. Okay. Don't worry about the individual names, but this is really exciting. And for me, it felt like walking on the moon because I, no one had ever looked at this before. And I eventually had the answer, at least one answer to my question. So what we're looking at is called a phylogeny. It's, it's really not a phylogeny of all the data, right? We're just, this is just one tree I'm showing you. And this is a consensus tree from the, um, the internally transcribed space region in, of the nuclear DNA. It is a gene tree because um, it's looking at that particular thing. But you can see, oops, sorry. What you can see is that here are the living species here at the branch tips. And then we go back and we can find these common ancestors that sort of show the relationships among them. And what's really exciting is that these are all from North America, right here. And these are largely all from Asia, with the exception that I'll point out in just a minute. And you can see that this branch had very strong support. So basically, we can say with a lot of confidence that, that this represents an accurate, an accurate depiction of relationships among these. Now, the sad thing is, is that this just looks like a hair comb, right? And that's because the region wasn't very useful for looking at species relation, relationships. And I didn't have the money to go on and do more work. And, I, and at the time, I didn't have the, the resources available to look for more useful gene regions. <coughs> and maybe there aren't. Um, other people working in, um, in Mediterranean borages had found that even though you see lots of differences in morphology, that it isn't always reflected in the genetic material that we're able to study. But again, this was, you know, this was 10, this was back in 2010 that I was working on this, 2011. A lot of things have changed since then. So now I might be able to answer or get more detail. But the important thing for tonight is that I had the answer to my question. I found that the North American species represented their own group. But what about this Lapula squarosa? Well, here it is, right over here. You can't read it from where you are. But this says Lapula squarosa 2435 North Dakota. Look at that. And it is grouping with the stuff from Asia, which you'd expect from a plant that is circumboreal, a plant that grows throughout the northern hemisphere. So whether it was introduced recently or introduced in the past, it doesn't matter. It just represents part of this big group, and it, it groups in with these Asian species. But that was just, to me, just so exciting. I mean, I would have been excited either way, but I, I don't know. I just thought, wow, that's just really amazing. OK. So let's go back to that original question. We had Lapula sclerosa, this widespread weed. And then we have all this other stuff. And I can show you some pretty pictures and different things now, but I can tell you that that's all the work of looking at thousands and thousands of specimens. And I still have questions, but this is what I'm gonna to present to you today. So this is Lapula fremontii. This is the plant that I told you about that grows in the Badlands. It occurs throughout the West. Um, I was able to get in and look at its chromosomes. It has I'm not going to bore you with the details, but there they are. How cool is that? It has 48 of them. The name that, um, that needed to be applied was not Lapula synchrosoides, as we once thought, but it actually goes all the way back to the Fremont expedition when um, they were going to California, and this plant was named in honor of, of Fremont, and that was the oldest name that was available, so that's the one that has to be applied. And so I looked at what's called a type specimen to see, does it look the same? And yes, it did. Um, and I, I, I want to get through all of these, so I'm not going to go into too much detail. But we were able to go back and start to apply these names. So there's Lapula sclerosa. And it's very distinctive from the others. There are characteristics like the style showing above the fruits. It branches in the upper, upper third. and it's basically an agricultural weed. 
Now, I'll let you in on a secret. It also shows up in the Rockies, and I think there's something funky going on there, because if we go back to Lapula fremontii, there's this weird variety, and I, one hypothesis I have is that maybe it's, it's, it's hybridizing, but that's just boring science talk. We'll move on. Here's the other crazy thing we discovered. And a lot of this comes from the literature that, well, the literature put it in my idea that, wait a minute, hold on, all this strange variation that people are seeing um, is because sometimes the fruits look different. So sometimes the spines are what we call conate and they fuse together. And sometimes they're free. And that seemed to be enough for some people to divide them, but it turns out there was this paper that came out in China that showed that plants can, some species, have more than one fruit type on a single plant, okay? So you get one fruit type early on in the season and one fruit type late, and they studied, and it turns out that this has an ecological um, advantage. The ones that stick on the plant, you know, they're, they're separated for the ones that drop off in space and time. They disperse differently and at different times, which means if conditions aren't favorable at one time, maybe they'll be favorable later on. Now, I can't speak to that with these, but I, I guess there's something going on because you end up with fruits where one of the nutlets will cling on to the plant and the other ones will drop off. But then it gets even more complicated because you'll end up with not only different fruit types on the same plant, or you'll have different fruit types on different plants, but then also within the fruit, you get different nutlet morphologies. And all of this stuff is just going on, and it, it, it makes trying to do taxonomy pretty much a nightmare, but not impossible. And so we'll start out with the ones that have the spines free. It turns out there are um, there's more than just Lapula rudowskii. There's Lapula occidentalis, which is widespread throughout the West. And then there's this weird creature here that sometimes makes spines and sometimes really doesn't, and it's smooth and it's tiny, and there aren't many collections of it, so that's something that needs more work. You can tell from that distribution map. It doesn't mean that these are the only places that it grows. It just means that there's no collections, right? We might find more of it. Whereas Lapula occidentalis has been widely collected throughout the West. Okay, and then there's this other strange beast. So this one has been lumped in with Lapula occidentalis. I wasn't brave enough to separate it out because I don't have enough evidence. But there are weird patterns of variation. Um, there's some in the south, in the southern desert of Arizona where they only grow in these very temporary washes. And then you have this other group with a distinct morphology that grows up in the Columbia Basin. And then you've got this mess in between where it's, it's just there's not enough collections and it's really hard to figure out what's going on. But it's better than calling them all one thing, right? Like, at least now we can talk about them. Then we have these beasties. They've got nutlets that, are, um, that have this inflated margin and you'll see three of them look the same and then there's this oddball. The oddball nutlet tends to hang on to the plant where these other ones drop off pretty quickly. And this is the one on the right, let's see right, left, right, over here that occurs in our region of the plains. And then you get this one down in limestone um, areas in Texas. And then this one grows in the Manco Shale um, in the Colorado Basin. And you can see it also has quite a bit of variation but once you start to look at a lot of plants, you can see that, okay, this falls all within the variation of this single species. So, um, yeah, really crazy stuff. I've never seen this one in the wild, but I had a colleague collect it um, as well and bring me more recent specimens. I was working primarily from historical collections um, from the 1800s. This one was described in the 19th century by E.L. Green, and it also is very particular. It grows, um, I think, in volcanic soils in the south. And I dropped off my notes because I'm like, oh, no one's going to care. But it is kind of interesting because it grows in a very particular soil type. And then this one, Lapula cuculata, was described by a Wyoming botanist, Avon Nelson. And this one occurs throughout parts of Wyoming Basin, and it tends to occur in clay and with atroplex and sagebrush. 
in the Great Basin. And this one's just one of my favorites. I don't know why I geek out about this stuff, but if you turn the nutlet over, it's got like this really smooth, shiny side, and it likes to grow in these like places where no one likes to go. So that's where I like to go, is where there's no people. So we have a lot in common, this plant and I. And then this is Lapula desertorum, and it grows in the Great Basin and um, parts of Nevada and the Snake River Plains. And there I'm just pointing out, like, look, look at that. The nutlet is taller than this thing called the gonophore, the part that it clings to. And that's exciting because no one really talked about that character in the North American stuff. But it turns out when you read the literature and see what's going on in other parts of the world, it gives you clues that, wait a minute, things are more complicated than you realized. OK, I'm just checking the time. And then this one. Oh, this is a new species, Lapula longispina, and that's just really funky. Check it out, like these spines, they're pointing out at an angle, and they've got this really funky thing going on there. And um, yeah, and I thought at first when I saw it, I was like, well, that's a weirdo. But then I found more of it, and it's like, no, that's not a weirdo, it's a pattern. And then I was like, oh my gosh, it's not a pattern, it's a different species. Very exciting stuff. Okay. So I, I hope that I didn't go too much all over the place, but what I wanted to convey to you tonight was just when you're really excited about something, when you find something you love, it can become your life's passion. And even if you find like, oh, I'm not good at this thing or that thing, I think you can be willing to overcome those things just to get to do the thing that you really, really, really want to do. And I really, really, really wanted to work on this problem. So much that um, when the opportunity came to work with Project Strive, even though I had like a secure full-time job, I'm like, first of all, I want to work with first-generation students and students with disabilities and low-income students and inspire them to stay in school and have adventures. And I want to give up my benefits so that I can go and work in the museum and study the thing I love and mooch off of my husband. <laughs> right? Yeah. And yeah. And it's really great. And so even though I was sad to have to put down my research for 10 years, it's still there. And I'm picking it up again. And as you can see from all these acknowledgments, nothing happens in a vacuum. We're all dependent on each other for support and for encouragement. Um, that goes for students and it goes for professionals as well. And so again, I just want to acknowledge um, that it was the seed money from Chadron State College in that research grant that allowed me to start this in the first place. And, um, and look at all those collections. And so science isn't a solitary thing at all. It's built upon collaboration and cooperation. And so I know that I went over 45 minutes, but I hope they were enjoyable. And just for Christine, um, we were talking about how this is a free talk. And I wanted to make sure everybody got their money's worth, and I hope you did. <laughs> but just in case I brought a bat. Hello. And um, because, Christine, as I recall, you went to a talk to see bats, and there were no bats. But look, oh, it's little brown bat. So little brown bat will be happy to help me take your questions. Um, and so what we'll do is feel free to ask me questions. I'll probably get nervous if everybody raises their hands all at once, because I know you're just filled with questions. Or not. Oh, I'm going to go with you in the back. And I know your name from the library, but I've forgotten because I'm Lisa. I'm, Lisa. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, I tried to guess about whether or not there's any information or studies done on, you know, maybe the utility of the plant in terms of herbalism, mm -hmm. or this little value plants or something along those lines. So Lisa asked me about the medicinal and um, sort of practical utility of these plants. And it turns out that um, they have, I can't pronounce the first word, it's like pyrolizidine, they have alkaloids. And in some parts of the world in Chinese medicine, they have done some exploration of um, lapula sclerosa and some other things. However, I'm sure you heard me say alkaloids. The problem is that alkaloids are poisonous and so there's 
kind of some contradictions there. I, I'm not, that's not really my background, but I did look at that. Um, and I was curious to find that in the archeological record, um, it seems like there are people in the Southwest who are collecting some of the seeds as well, because they do have oil. But I wouldn't recommend using them straight up just because like many plants in the borage family, they have toxins. But, um, but it's worth looking into, and if you're interested, at some point, I can show you some of the literature that's out there because people have looked at that, but it's mostly been in Asia and looking at specific, um, specific species. I think most people just find them interesting because either, I don't know why we find them interesting, they're strange, but <laughs> they don't have much utility, but what's really cool about them is that they can survive in these harsh environments and ecologically they do some fun things. But thank you. And Steve, you, you are the next person to raise your hand. My question isn't nearly as serious. That's okay. My question is, Susan? Yes. Is it true in America, people buy mushrooms at the supermarkets? <laughs> <laughs> so Steve has a very serious question about fungi. He would like to know, is it true? that in North America, we buy our mushrooms at the supermarket. And he asks that because of a very interesting detail. In Siberia, nine, I think it's something like 99 point something percent of mushrooms are edible. Mm -hmm. Some of them are more edible than others. <laughs> As I found out on one of my last nights in Irkutsk when someone regaled us with a feast of mushrooms and put them on our pizza, and I thought, wow, this tastes horrible. <laughs> and then I, um, how can I, 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 let's just say that Svetlana then for the next several days gave me lots of yogurt and um, rolls of paper towels because they're the toilets don't flush. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> So just because 99.9% .9 of the mushrooms are edible does not mean that you should eat them when you go to Siberia, but there are very many that are good. And there are wild strawberries. Also, it is true, in North America, we eat the skins of our potatoes and our bread smushes. Because in Russia, the bread actually gets moldy if you don't eat it. And, and we don't have, they don't have all those additives in the bread. And so you can eat a lot and still lose 10 pounds. It's a miracle. I ate chocolate and ice cream and bread and like fish and whatever, and I lost 10 pounds just sitting in a van. It was a miracle. OK, any more serious questions for me, please? Oh, bummer. Oh, wait. OK, I'll go with Christine and then Lisa. So once um, you figured out that the North American one that you found was Asiatic, are there other people that are interested in figuring out like how that ended up here, or is that? Kind of oh, you mean the one species Lapula sclerosa that's weedy? So, yes. So that one is kind of tricky because I. Do you remember I used the word circumboreal? So Christine asked about like, is it Asiatic? Is it North American? Like, what do we know about it? How did it get here? Um, the thought is, since it, it pretty much goes all the way into Alaska and then all the way around the Arctic Circle. So it may just have been there. Okay. If it was introduced though, the guess is that its wide distribution was probably influenced by the importation of sheep. Its common name is sheep's burr, and it's a um, horrible pest in areas where raising sheep for you know, the most popular livestock, it's problematic, it gets in the wool and ruins it. So, um, as for like economically important plants, it's an economically important pest. Mm -hmm. But the thought is, it's you know it was probably been there, but just widely spread. But we you know that's just a hypothesis. Lisa. Yeah, and that was kind of my question also. But I wonder if there is evidence of the spread of the plant through DNA studies. So. DNA can answer only so much, and especially when you have only access to, to different parts of it, because we don't under, you know, I couldn't sequence the entire genome. There are people who do things called phylogeography, where they study distributions, but I'm not even sure if we'd be able to find a marker that would work. 
Um, one hypothesis is that these plants are, are fairly recent, so Pleistocene, but again, that's just a hypothesis. Um, so being able to, to trace those kinds of questions may not be, may not be possible. Yeah. Are there fossilized versions of it? Yeah. So that's a really great question. That was my question too. And um, it turns out that there are some pack rat middens. And in one of my earlier talks, I had the exact date. I'm not good with numbers, but again, it's Pleistocene. It's it's um, pack rat middens um, where these little pack rats would go around and pick up the fruits. And um, this was in the Southwest. And so. Uh, and I know the Pleistocene is kind of a long thing. Forgive me. I don't, you know, I don't have an exact date, but um, let's just say that it, it's it's old enough to suggest that these things were not introduced by, you know, at least by um, by Europeans coming through and dispersing them right there in the fossil record. There is also um, something called a protolapula that someone described from um, around the Ashfall area, but I. I I'm not really sure about that. I've not seen it myself to examine it, but I'm skeptical because the evidence seems to suggest that this group diversified in, um, and its closest relatives diversified over in Asia and um, like Central Asia and the Mediterranean and then spread outward from there. And these things do have little burrs. So animal dispersal is one way they could get around and they could certainly cling to people who are migrating. It's just, it's, you know, DNA is great, but it can't answer all those questions. They're just questions we may, we just can't answer them. And that's one of them. But there are, there are fossils, and I'd like to find more. Mm. Oh, yes, sir. Oh. No, no, please don't be Do sorry. Do you have advice on how to find, on the best way to find some around here from the On the best way to? To locate some around here. Oh, yeah. Huh. And I'm like, well, why would you want to go on? Well, but yeah, because now you're interested. Um, the easiest thing, I mean, they're not rare. They're, it's not like they're special. But the best thing to do is to wait till this, the, the rain in May. And I would promised Daniel I would repeat questions. The question is, how can I go and find some? Go out to Toadstool Park and walk around and look at the beautiful flora in May see the gumbo lilies, walk around, and just step out onto those sparsely vegetated areas, and you just might see some growing. They like shallow sod tables, and then what happens, I think, based on my observations, is that I think the water washes them when they fall from the plant, and then disperses them out onto these, what I just called an outwash plain, because there's nothing else growing there. And then there's no competition, and they come up, but they do seem to need moisture to germinate if it's very dry. Um, for example, in 2004, I could hardly find any because they need water to germinate. And then when you go further west into Wyoming, you can find a lot of them just growing in these, you know, just sparsely vegetated places. But um, one good thing you can do if you're interested in learning more about plant, plant distributions is the High Plains Herbarium has a database um, that you can access online. And I can talk to you about that later. And you can look up all sorts of information and learn about distributions of plants. Um, my advice always is to take pictures and leave plants unless you're interested in doing collections for a museum um, and learning. But, um, but they are quite pretty. And I, I'm like, oh, those lapulas are so happy that people are interested in them now. They're not. I'm happy. <laughs> Dr. Lady, did you have a question? Oh, no. no I, I was asking if perhaps oh. oh, you're just, just putting expectations on. Yeah. Well, thank you all so much.